automatisch live ja, dat is een vraag in het plan van Bij Van Appel of wat dat is. Ja, dat is een vraag van enkel van hier, ja. niet van Bij Van Appel. Precies, ja. ja. Uh, daarom, uh, als je een vraag hoort, dat je eerst een vraag kunt herhalen in. Ah ja, een vraag herhalen. Ja, ja. ja, ja. Oké, okay, thank you everyone for joining. I think we can almost start. Welcome. So today we are happy to welcome Carlos de Bruck. So he is a Belgian scientist actually, but he did his PhD partly, well, it was joint Leiden and Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California, uh, which he obtained I think in 2000, right? So, and then he went on uh, to for a Marie Curie Fellowship in Paris for uh, almost three years. And then he joined ESO, European Southern Observat Observatory, where he has been working since 2003, so that, that's, that's almost 20 years. Uh, and he's a project uh, scientist there, and so today his talk will be uh, the role of ESO uh, beyond optical astronomy. So please, Carlos, you have the floor. Yep, thanks a lot. Well, it's really a pleasure to finally be in Leuven. I really was ashamed I had not been as a Belgian <laughs> to, to Leuven, and it finally the shame will be erased by he being here today. And I hope, uh, actually, by the end of the talk, especially for the students among you, I will give some options of how you can uh, be my successor at ESO, or m successors, because we really need more people to come to, to ESO, especially the young people. We need more young people to come to ESO. And yeah, I'm not going to make the, the whole talk about, about how well it is to ESO, but uh, really, it's, there are lots of opportunities. And don't be afraid of, uh, of don't think ESO is beyond your reach. Its uh, motivation says it all. It really helps a lot. So uh, yeah, I, I will also be around, of course, afterwards. So I, I will stay around if you have uh, personal questions on, on how you could apply. I will go more about that in the end. So um, yeah, some of you were also already yesterday in Brussels for the ESO Belgian uh, 60th anniversary, which was, I, I think, uh, an immense success. Uh, I think it was a giving you a, a big overview of what, uh, what astronomy has done in Belgium, uh, how uh, Belgian astronomy has benefited from ESO. And of course, the telescopes you, you know mo the best uh, from ESO are these four big boxes here. I mean, this is a composite image, of course. This, these telescopes are no, not all standing together. Um, so that's the VLT. Uh, and then you have uh, La Silla here in the foreground. And then, of course, we're building the extremely large telescope a big one, um, but what I will mostly concentrate on today is these telescopes here, uh, ALMA, so uh, ESO does other things, and well, which I should also talk about, but I'm not a big expert, I'll, I'll admit, but that is also in the future, is this telescope here is the uh, Cherenkov Telescope Array, which is a, uh, a really a gamma ray telescope uh, that will be built uh, soon in Paranal between the VLT and the ELT, actually. Okay, so, now, going towards submillimeter astronomy. So, this is a bit of a historical introduction of how ESO got into submillimeter astronomy. So, the first one that uh, did this was the CEST, the Suizo ESO submillimeter telescope. And there's multiple pictures of, of CEST, but I deliberately wanted to show this one, which I have a bit of a personal connection to, because this was taken on the 2nd of July 2019, and I was somewhere here below. This is during the solar eclipse on La Silla, so, so this is why that shows this particular image. So the CEST is actually a 15 meter uh, submillimeter telescope. It's actually a copy of one of the IRAM telescopes in the French Alps. So it, again, it helps a lot if you design the telescope to make one additional copy and to design a new telescope from scratch, because the design takes several million of euros to design the telescope, so that's why we try not to make too many new types of telescopes because that costs a lot of money to, to do the design. So this telescope was built and actually started operating in 1987 and it was the first time that ESO was going beyond the optical domain. It's not 100% true either because the 3.6 uh, the meter telescope at La Silla 
was even used as a radio telescope in the 70s already. So that uh, people, uh, Tom Wilson, one of the astronomers, actually put a radio receiver on the optical telescope, but that's of course three and a half meter is a relatively small telescope for radio waves. Because of course with the longer wavelengths you have much less photons, so you need more collecting area. So, but this was the first dedicated millimeter and submillimeter telescope that ESO was operating, and it was the first one to be in the Southern Hemisphere. So in this uh, respect, the CEST was really a precursor and a pioneer of a millimeter and submillimeter astronomy in the Southern Hemisphere. So it, oh, and for example, the, the large and small Mediterranean clouds, the galactic center, uh, they're way easier to observe in the south than in the north. And, well, LMC and SMC you can only do from the south. So this really opened up a lot of new science that could be done and it was showing that uh, there is actually a lot of sense to put millimeter telescopes also in the southern hemisphere. And ESO as the European Southern Observatory <laughs> uh, could not uh, pass on on, on this uh, opportunity, of course. So we collaborated with uh, our Swedish uh, colleagues and had this telescope and really it did a lot of science. But then in 2003, uh, a new telescope came at a better site, and that's the telescope I know very well because I was, have been product scientist for this telescope uh, for, for many years. Um, so this is the APEX telescope, the Atacama Pathfinder experiment. And this again is a, another prototype now of an ALMA antenna. And again, a prototype means it's, it's the first. <laughs> so it was designed uh, as one of the two uh, or three ALMA type antennas and it was adapted. So uh, what is additional is all of these cabins that are hanging on the side. So you have two Nesbit cabin, you have a Nesbit A cabin, a Nesbit B cabin, an instrument cabin and a compressor platform. And then the Cascan C cabin, that is part of the standard ALMA antenna. So all of this parts that you see here are all added on uh, in addition to, to an ALMA telescope. So it's just an addition. And why do we do that? Well, it's to have lots of instruments installed on the telescope, because a telescope is only uh, worth, what it can only work if there are very powerful instruments installed on them. Um, yeah, so and, uh, this ESO again did not do alone. We uh, collaborated with the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn and with the Swedish colleagues, which who were already working with ESO, so that's why APEX is a direct successor of CEST. So that's again, how we got into more and more into submillimeter astronomy. So APEX started science observations in 2005, so that's uh, six, seven years before ALMA really started doing uh, the, first, the first science. So it really was a pathfinder for ALMA, and the original idea was that APEX would stay for about five, six years. Well, it's been there for 17 years now, uh, and, but now really ALMA is, has taken over so ESO is gradually moving out of APEX. It's becoming a hosted telescope. The Max Planck in, in Bonn will take over fully the telescope, like basically like the Trappist or uh, Speculoos Belgian telescopes at ESO are also hosted telescopes. So APEX will become this as of next year. But there's a lot of science that has already been done and especially APEX has been a pathfinder for new instruments. I'm not going to go through all of the instruments that APEX does. I mean, I'm of course more than interested to, <laughs> uh, to explain to you there's lots of bolometer arrays that do wide field imaging, something that ALMA does, is not very good at is wide field imaging, uh, so, but APEX is deliberately doing the complement of this. But uh, what I would like to highlight is that this instrument, the uh, SAPI instrument, the Swedish ESOPI instrument for, uh, for APEX, and that one is actually a miniature of the receivers, the instruments that we have on, on ALMA. So instead of 10, we can have three receivers in there. And this has been a very powerful test bed to actually develop technologies and to also to get users to start, <coughs> start experiencing the science and finding the, the best targets you could do for ALMA follow-up. And for example, uh, well, Professor Linde Sin has been one of the early users of, of APEX for this in, on AGB stars. She was uh, 10 years ago already observing all the AGB stars that now led to the Atomium project. So this is really, uh, even in Leuven, uh, APEX has been used as a proper pathfinder for Atomium, you could say. Um, so the instruments that we have in SAPIA, the receivers, uh, we give these numbers, this is all band uh, five, uh, seven and nine. Uh, so band five has been 
one of the user, the, the bands that have been added on to, ABEC, to Alma later on. So we had one receiver that was ready, and rather than to let it sit uh, in a cupboard for three years till it comes online on Alma, we said like, well, let's put this on Apex and start, uh, start, this, start going with the science. So we actually found new targets uh, and started doing a bit of the science three years before Alma. And we got a lot of experience on this. So the community was much more ready for Alma Band 5 by, by having three years of head start on, uh, on Apex. And also, band, another receiver is Band 9. So we first had a copy, a leftover of the Alma Band 9 receivers, which were operational at, at Alma. But we are now upgrading these receivers to a more powerful brand. So it's basically in practice what it means. It's, uh, it's a bit technical, but we uh, have a sideband separating receiver rather than a double sideband receiver, which means the two sidebands you get, the two parts of the frequency coverage or the wavelength coverage are often overlapped in the current Alma receivers. And in this new receiver we have on Apex, they're already separated, which is a lot better. It uh, makes it much clearer what you're, what you're seeing. So, and this is now uh, being developed for an upgrade of the Alma Band 9 receiver. So we're gaining all of this experience at Apex to see how we can upgrade the Alma receiver. So it's really a, a very good technology test bed and a development test bed for, uh, for Alma. And the same thing is undergoing, although this is not decided the upgrade for Alma yet uh, with Band 7. So what the receiver we have at Apex is twice the, uh, the bandwidth, so the, the, uh, the wavelength coverage of the Alma receivers, and that's also being tested now um, to see what kind of experience are we getting out from, uh, from Apex to improve Alma further. Okay, then of course the main thing, we, uh, the main instrument we have uh, for submillimeter astronomy is Alma. So it's really a, a dream come through. There was lots of dreams. Everybody was dreaming in their own side, the Europeans, the um, Americans, and the, uh, the Asians were all dreaming in their own side. And for once, we really all came together. And it's the first ground-based worldwide uh, observatory around. And I think this has been, uh, it, yeah, it's a bit more complex to do it that way, but the, uh, the end result is definitely worth the effort of, uh, of collaborating and, and really finding a common way. So Alma, is of course very powerful. I'm sure you have heard uh, a lot about Alma already. Uh, so we have uh, six, in total of 66 antennas. So there's 12, uh, so there's 54 uh, antennas that are of 12 meter diameter and 12 that are of seven meter diameter. So I will go into this uh, in more detail soon. Um, and they're all on the Gasantor Plateau at 5,000 meters in uh, Northern Chile. And you have to go that high to be able to observe in uh, millimeter wavelength. And that's illustrated here. So here, now I am, of course, <laughs> I am, I'm sorry, I'm mentioning gigahertz. <laughs> so, this <laughs> so this wavelength goes from, this is shorter wavelength, this is longer wavelength. And in radio astronomy, we often use frequencies, so it's in gigahertz. So basically, classical radio telescopes are here on the, on the left, so that's where the VLA and other uh, radio telescopes, the SKA, they will all be on, on this side. And here you, uh, you get the, uh, the infrared, so uh, Herschel was working here, and JWST is somewhere near, <laughs> near the border, here, near the edge of the, the wall. Um, <coughs> so what you see in, in blue is the atmospheric transmission. So that, of course, varies with how much water there is in the atmosphere, and that is why we have to go very high. So the higher you go, the less water there is. Of course, uh, as you can see outside, here is not the best place. Uh, Belgium is not the best place to put a, a submillimeter telescope. That's why we go in the north of Chile. Anywhere in Europe is, is not so good. So we, we are not worse than anybody else. But uh, So we want to, want to go high. And then you see these, these bands, some of these bands here in between. For example, this is a, um, a big atmospheric band here and here. So nothing comes through, even if you go to 5,000 meters, there's still no emission comes through here. So that's why Alma defined these uh, gray zones here are each uh, different receiver. So each receiver, you could say it's a separate instrument covering a different wavelength range, uh, and wavelength range has been optimized to basically cover these, these bands, these atmospheric bands. Because it is, uh, so you say, why don't we make just one instrument that does it all, well, it's a bit like in the optical. You have, a, uh, you have an optical um, instrument or a spectrograph, 
or an imager or a spectrograph, and you have a near infrared instrument, you have a mid infrared instrument, uh, so you have to do it separately. And this this range here, this is one more than one uh, order of magnitude in wavelength. So this is even more than what you would see in the optical. So this is why we need to split the uh, the instruments, the receivers, into separate separate bands so that you you can actually design them that they're very performant. So, but we have these 10 different bands. Well, here only eight bands are showing, but in the end I'll say that band one and two are coming. So we're going even more on this side. So that's also, Alma is growing. Um, and what is important also is here, the spectral resolution. So we are actually, uh, we have a fixed resolution in, in kilohertz. It's, uh, you could call it in, in nanometers or, or actually uh, picometers if you would want. Um, so, but that uh, varies of course from, from which band to, uh, you go because it goes with, with wavelength or frequency. So in band three, you get about uh, 80 uh, meters per second, but in band 10, you get uh, 10 kilometers, uh, 10 meters per second. So that's, uh, you could actually use ALMA even as a speed camera. It's called about 40 kilometers per hour. So it's uh, very accurate. So you can determine speeds to <laughs> as fast as, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're driving 50, ALMA will see you're, you're speeding already. Okay, so, but ALMA does more than just frequency coverage. It also does a lot of spatial scales. So here's an example of HL Tau. It's uh, one of the, the first showcase examples of how ALMA could really go into very detailed structures in uh, protoplanetary disks. So you see these, these rings here these, uh, that have been cleared out. Uh, so this is one of, uh, we have done, ALMA has done better than this since. Um, but you see these, these uh, orbits that have been cleared out by protoplanets that are forming in the, the disk planets and protoplanets. So really see the formation of planetary systems ongoing uh, with ALMA. So JWS2 is doing some of this too, but ALMA is doing this for the colder gas. So what ALMA detects is really cold gas and molecular, uh, that's really the cold universe that we, we look at. So we reach uh, res resolutions of uh, 25 to 75 milliard seconds if we go into the most extended configuration. So, and we can use uh, lots of multiple configurations. You can put the antennas uh, in the largest configuration of 150 meters. So that's quite, quite close together. Makes nice pictures if, you, if they're all close together. But you can also put them very far away, uh, up to 16 kilometers one from another. And then you get the, these high, um, high spatial resolution observations. So how do we do that? Well, each of the antennas uh, has, has are put on one of these antenna beds, so it's a big a concrete uh, pad that is put down deep enough so that it's on a solid ground, which is not so easy. I've actually been uh, digging myself in the ground up there the last weeks, and <laughs> I know how hard it is to dig at 5,000 meters and shovel, shovel dust, so uh, you need a lot of <laughs> oxygen, <laughs> sometimes some extra oxygen. Um, but these have been carefully designed, so and you see these little uh, things sticking out. Those are the points where you can position these 12 meter antennas to an accuracy of one, better than one millimeter. So you have to put it very carefully. So you use this, this big um, transporter, we have two of those. So you put the telescope that weighs, weighs more than 10 tons, pick it up and drive it around uh, from one pad to another. There's 238 of those pads uh, that you can put. And then you put it down here. As you can see, there is a person standing here. And well, it's maybe difficult to see, but the person has a joystick in, in his hands uh, so that they can actually position very closely where you're not sitting inside the cabin here, uh, where you can see the driver is normally up, up front. But here you go out to position the telescope very accurately uh, to this, this, this very accurate accuracy of a few, of a better than a millimeter. So, so it's, it's a quite a complex uh, way to, to operate. So I mean, I would like to highlight a little bit that uh, ALMA is difficult to build, but it's also complex to, to really maintain and you need to have good procedures to, to structure. So building a telescope is complex, but operating a telescope is often ignored, <laughs> but it's, especially for the case of ALMA, it's not so easy to, to drive around and to connect things. Uh, so then uh, each, of these antenna pads, there's also here a little trap where the cables come out and the, each of the cables need to be connected. And from each of these antenna pads, they go to a central building where there's a big supercomputer or correlator. And there's about 10,000 kilometers of uh, fibers up there on the, on the high side. 
So to put those fibers in, that took quite a while. <laughs> so 10,000 kilometers, that's, uh, that's quite a bit uh, up there at these ele elevations. So why do we need to do that? Well, if you have an interferometer, you, yeah, as I said, you put in the extended configuration to get the, the fine details. But uh, if you do that, you over-resolve certain structures, wider structures. And so for this, you need to complement that with, uh, or if you're looking at a source which you're not interested in the finest details, but more in the more extended diffuse emission in it, then you, um, you need to put the antennas closer together. Otherwise, in the Fourier space, you would over-resolve. You would not uh, cover these, these uh, spatial scales. So that's why we need to put them closer together. And uh, so that's why we use these different configurations in a fixed schedule. Because, of course, you don't want to move those telescopes every, uh, every other day. So it's, uh, you want to move them once every month or so to a different configuration. Okay, now going a little bit more towards the science that Alma is doing. So again, this is going to be a very incomplete, uh, very, very incomplete highlighting of a few of the science cases that, that Alma will do. But um, we're saying a little bit what, uh, so you can see here a, uh, oops, this one too many. Oh, no, 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 too fast. Uh, so here you have uh, lots of spectral channels. And so you, this is actually in band 10. So this is the highest uh, frequency, the lowest, shortest wavelength band that needs the best weather. But to show this is compared here with the hi-fi uh, spectrum with the Herschel uh, satellite that was taken uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it's actually inverted, so it's going down. So you should see the lines you see here that look a bit like absorption lines have swept uh, just for presentation purposes. But you see with ALBA, you see many more lines. So you have really the spectral grasp is, is a lot. But also continuum sensitivities uh, are quite good. I mean, these are just numbers, but you should put them uh, for your own science cases, you could uh, have it in the observing time calculator uh, from ALMA. So you can calculate how much you want and uh, depending on how long you integrate, of course. Oops. So giving a few more observing modes, what ALMA is doing, ALMA is also doing polarization. So you can actually have uh, linear polarization from uh, an even circular polarization. So Zeeman splitting you can do uh, quite well with ALMA. That can be done up to band seven for now. The highest frequency bands will are still being commissioned. This is a bit more, more complex. But you can also do solar observing. So ALMA, you may not think of ALMA as a solar telescope, but it is. Uh, so here you see images of the sun uh, taken at different, uh, different frequencies, different wavelengths. And the advantage of this large set of bands we have at ALMA is that uh, each of the, uh, the wavelengths goes to a little bit deeper in the solar photosphere. So you can actually probe different depths in the photosphere of the sun. And by doing that uh, in short in high cadence, because the sun is so bright, we can afford to uh, just integrate a few seconds. So we can actually see uh, the turbulence in the solar, um, solar atmosphere. So really, this is almost like uh, astro seismology, but on the most nearby star we have. Uh, so you can really go through and see how uh, the turbulence, how the protuberances and the sunspots uh, are really bubbling up from inside the surface to the outside. So this is quite powerful. Um, and unfortunately, uh, solar observing has not been used enough. So there should be more solar proposals. It's, uh, so we're really the solar astronomers are pushing ALMA to shorten these time scales because they have enough signal to noise. They just need uh, it to be done faster to see the variations. So, but it's, it's happening and solar data are there. You can see movies of, uh, of the sun then made with ALMA. So that's, and then it was complemented with dedicated solar telescopes uh, that work in the optical and the infrared, the infrared and space satellites. And so uh, you really can learn a lot about what's happening in, in our sun. Uh, you can do other things like combine ALMA with other telescopes, with uh, just integrate ALMA in the VLBI network, for example, in the Event Horizon Telescope, which you probably have heard uh, looking at black holes and other uh, targets with uh, ultra high sp uh, spatial resolution. But you can also do time domain astronomy, so you can really look for time variable uh, uh, processes in, in astronomy. So here's a word cloud that you can see a little bit what kind of science ALMA is really doing. So you see a lot of gas emissions, CO, carbon monoxide, dust, uh, there's disk science, so you really 
have a bit of an idea what kind of science it's. I mean, ALMA is a very versatile telescope. It's open to a very broad community. Uh, it's a bit like the VLT with uh, the 12 instruments on the VLT. Uh, ALMA does have these different bands, but they're really almost thought of as a very broad uh, research uh, group of, um, of people, so, so I mean of, of users. And uh, it's interesting to be in Leuven because uh, there's one, uh, one category specifically for stars, that's category five on, in the ALMA speak, and that category is actually not that much used. So it is actually almost a niche to be in, to get into ALMA, because ALMA wants to foresee and to, to, uh, to guarantee that stellar science is also being done, and so you're in a very good position. The only uh, category five large program is Atomium. So, so keep, <laughs> don't be afraid of applying to ALMA. <laughs> okay, now going a little bit from the outside to the inside uh, in science. So now moving all the way to high redshift universe. So ALMA is also one of the telescopes that can be used to determine uh, redshifts. For example, this is one of the most distant uh, galaxies that I believe. So, so I'm, a, I'm a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, hard. Uh, I mean, I work myself in, in high redshift and distant uh, objects. So I only believe a redshift when I really see clear emission lines and, and this one, this one, it's not ultra high signal to noise, but there are other indications uh, that confirm that this is a real line. Uh, so this is a redshift 9.1. There is another one from JWST at 9.8, I believe. And there's many candidates at uh, redshifts uh, up to 14 and 16, but they, the first telescope that those people uh, who were actually getting the, the JWST data, um, where they wanted to confirm the redshifts was ALMA. They all turned to ALMA to confirm, and thus far, they have not confirmed whether that means that the, uh, the objects are too faint uh, or that the redshift is wrong. Well, I'll leave you to, to guess. I don't know the answer myself, so this is <laughs> to be seen. But what is more important in these very distant objects, ALMA does more than just determining the redshifts or uh, saying that they're there. You can actually even look at rotation curves in galaxies, you can spatially and spectrally resolve them. So you can do a lot more science with them with ALMA because it's such a very sensitive and high resolution uh, telescope that you can really do a lot of science. And here, uh, cosmology helps us a bit because once one, uh, you would say, well, if you go further and further away, the details would be smaller and smaller. Well, the universe, the geometry of the universe helps us in this case because the angular size distance, so basically, if you have a source that is one kiloparsec in size, it will remain roughly the same uh, from redshift one to redshift 20 or so. This, the actual apparent size on the, on the sky in arc seconds or milli arc seconds will remain roughly the same. So that allows one, uh, the astronomers to really probe a lot of uh, small details even at the, the highest redshift. So that's, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, so some of the, the science that we do at high redshift is sometimes easier <laughs> than in the local universe, especially for the high redshift lines that then shift out of the, uh, the bands where you can do them from the ground. They go into the bands where you can do it. Actually, that is the next slide. Just um, you remember these, these different bands here. And so if you go to the highest frequency bands, um, <coughs> and so this is actually the observed frequency. So those are these different bands here, ALMA, and there's also some VLA bands. If you put in redshift, you have all these lines, the CO lines, the carbon monoxide lines. They have uh, row vibrational states that go, go on to almost uh, indefinite. Um, so you have all of these going through. Uh, they all, if you see, basically once a line crosses one of these horizontal gray boundaries, you can observe them with ALMA. And here, you have additional lines, so molecular and atomic lines, so have all these bright, fine structure lines, like carbon, atomic carbon, atomic oxygen. So really the ground state transition of carbon and oxygen are in the, 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 the far infrared or the infrared almost, but at high redshift, they shift into the bands that ALMA can observe. So that makes that one can observe these lines, especially these uh, oxygen one and two and oxygen three lines. You can observe them with ALMA at high redshift, while from the ground, it's almost impossible because you need, <laughs> it is impossible basically. You have to go to space and we currently, after Herschel, haven't had uh, a new uh, 
new uh, space mission, like especially now Spica has not been approved, it will take a bit longer before we have that capability again. But ALMA can do this at high redshift and even spatially resolve them to scales of uh, 10 milliard seconds. So you can do science at redshift uh, five, six uh, and, and higher that you cannot do in the local universe because that's quite, quite a powerful thing for a high redshift uh, universe. Coming a, a little bit back more towards the ground, <laughs> uh, closer to us, um, then star forming regions. So you see here an image of a uh, combined image in the N2H plus line, which is a molecule uh, that traces very dense gas of uh, 10 to the five or 10 to the six per cube centimeter. So it's really very dense gas. And who says very dense gas says the direct feed uh, for, for star formation. So this is uh, fuel for star formation rather. Um, so this, you, in this line you see here, this is a region in, in Orion, um, and you see all these fil very filamentary structures. And the high resolution, the, the smallest scales here have been done with ALMA, while it has been combined with the uh, IREM telescope uh, that's observed the same thing. It's again to get this very extended scale, so they have the more diffuse emission is, uh, is added in by, by a single dish telescope. Um, so and this really shows how star formation is happening in star forming clouds. It's really happening more in filaments. So it's really this filamentary structures and ALMA thanks to its high sensitivity uh, can actually detect all of this. And here you see this the same in the, uh, in the LMC. Um, so also in, in nearby galaxies here, ALMA is it's, it's much more shallow than, than these observations. And but because this is where ALMA has to do mosaicing. So you could do up to 150 mosaics together to map a larger area that you wouldn't see in a single observation. Coming even closer, you have the, uh, planet formation. So this is actually the better examples from the, uh, than the HL Tau that I showed before. So this is, I think this is one of the most in personal, <laughs> personally, and I'm not working in this field, but I think this is one of the most stunning results from ALMA are these images here. Where you see protoplanetary disk, you see all of these rings happening here. You see sub rings, uh, and it's really very stunning what kind of accuracy and uh, high dynamic range uh, observations that, that ALMA can show. And here we, uh, we have one advantage that the central star is not so bright. So you don't have the dynamic range problem you have in the optical to go near a uh, bright, bright star. So there's a lot of things shown yesterday uh, with the, uh, the firefly around the, the lighthouse, uh, e example for looking for protoplanetary uh, protoplanets. Well, with ALMA you don't have that problem because the star is much less bright in the, uh, the submillimeter. So you can really get this, this, high, um, uh, this high accuracy of, of the observations. Um, so there's a lot of new large programs going on on uh, protoplanetary science. So they're looking at the disk face on, but also edge on to see the warping, the, the transfer of mass uh, and, and CO. The, uh, so you see they have the so-called snow line where, where the, um, the formation of, of more heavier molecules are happening. So you can really go more, much more into details of, of planet formation and planet system formation. Oh, that was one too fast. Um, so you also, of course, M ALMA does chemical complexity. It really does a lot of lines. So this is the galactic center, which is, of course, one of the most rich, uh, richest uh, lines uh, that line spectra that you can see. But it's so rich that you don't see the continuum anymore. So it gets even uh, the sensitivity of ALMA is such that you, you really get into a problem of trying to find where is the continuum. The, there are lines all over the place. So it's really need detailed models. And we often see lots of lines that are not even known there. And this is also an, uh, an, a nearby galaxy, NGC 253, which has been mapped in uh, lots of spectral lines. You see, again, lots of lots of uh, spectral lines that you can see with ALMA. So this really, the models uh, are almost behind of the, uh, the observations. And so here, Atomium comes home. So this is a bit strange to uh, give Silke's slide here. Uh, and then Lynn, I think, well, Silke prov provided, but I guess Lynn had a, <laughs> an, uh, contribution in this, so it's really the Atomium project is really uh, showing amazing images of these uh, 
these disks, I guess I don't need to explain <laughs> the details of Atomium here, but this, again, the interaction between uh, simulations and observations are really very strong in this case, uh, because these, these structures that you model, you want to see them here, and then you go back and forth, so it's really an iterative process to understand all of these, and the Atomium project is really giving stunning images, and I have seen the conception from this at Apex, so it's really very, very nice to see that uh, this uh, turns out into such a nice uh, large program with lots of observations done. And I presume you will be, uh, these are just the first papers. I think they, I hope there will be another big set coming in the coming years and we'll keep you busy for a while. But don't let it end there. Keep, <laughs> keep uh, sending in more proposals, follow proposals. That's the way it should go. So uh, also look at different bands and don't be afraid of high frequency bands. Is the, the one little advice I would like to give to the uh, Atomium people, don't be afraid of high frequency bands. Okay, I shouldn't be giving an Atomium talk here. <laughs> I'm not the best place person, so I'll go on. Uh, so this is a bit, just a few examples of time domain astronomy. So gamma ray burst and, and others, uh, you have shock events uh, that are happening. So it's just, yeah, it doesn't look as appealing as, <laughs> as a protoplanet disk or uh, AGB star envelopes. Uh, of course, it's just time, uh, time scales, but it's still a lot of interesting astronomy that is being done with ALMA also in the time domain. And what is, I mean, in, as such, this image is not very spectacular, but if you know what it is, of course, you know how spectacular this is. And this is not only ALMA, but ALMA is one of the central telescopes and the most sensitive telescope in the event horizon uh, telescope observations of the, uh, the black holes. So this is really the Schwarzschild radius uh, that you see. This is really event horizon. So when it's black here, it means there is nothing in the middle. So this is really the last stable orbit that you, you can see. And uh, every, basically, April, ALMA is, uh, and all, and 10 or 11 other telescopes worldwide join up together to do these EHT observations. And I think we will, uh, in the coming years, also be seeing movies of this, uh, this infalling gas into the, the, uh, the black hole, the central black hole. of. Uh, so really can get much more information out, and from those movies you can then get much more physics out of the black holes, uh, for example, their spin, and so it's a lot of things. So, summarizing a little bit where ALMA stands, uh, so here, this is actually um, the angular resolution one gets, so from below one milliarc second to several milliarc seconds, and this is the wavelength and frequency range, so uh, from way high wa long wavelength to short wavelength, and here you have the optical telescopes and the green is the ELT, and ALMA is here in this area. So you can see that actually ALMA already now is going uh, to the same level or even slightly lower. Uh, so if you want to prepare yourself for the ELT, you may, the only telescope you have access to right now, because this NGVLA is not online yet, SK is not online yet. So the only telescope that is already working at uh, a few milliarc second uh, scales is actually ALMA plus VLBI observations, of course. But uh, the only really full array that does this is ALMA. So this is really, if you want to prepare for the ELT, I'd say uh, you should really <laughs> look forward uh, to prepare yourself with, with ALMA and prepare your high resolution science uh, with ALMA because then uh, otherwise uh, you will <laughs> you will not be uh, as well prepared as for this kind of giant step that the ELT will, will bring. So, you're not alone trying to use ALMA. As if I sold ALMA a bit to you, uh, you're not the only one. So there's the pressure is about a factor of six or seven, uh, and it keeps increasing a little bit. It doesn't keep increasing in number of proposals, but in length of the proposals. So. But that should not scare you off. Uh, a good proposal has a good chance and you should keep trying. Uh, so it's, you have a different way of evaluating the proposals now with the distributed peer review. So keep trying, you get lots of feedback, improve your proposals. But in particular, there is also uh, stellar science is being protected in this. So, so you may have actually a bit of a, a good uh, head start here. Um, as I said, large programs, uh, larger amounts of times, especially large programs, have become very popular. So the last two semesters were 40 large programs submitted and uh, five or four or five or six were accepted. So the, it's, it's quite hard to get large programs through, but there is one from Leuven, the, the Atomium. So 
you know how to do it. So keep doing, <laughs> keep doing it. I would say, don't be afraid of of doing this. Uh, uh, it's yeah, it's competitive, but you need to keep trying. Uh, so, is the output working? Yes. So, this is the number of uh, publications. So, Alma is this blue line, and it's remarkably similar So from the years of operations, so comparing different telescopes. So, you see that Alma is the, and the light blue line here is the VLT. They are basically uh, on the same line. So, that means their productivity is, is about uh, com is comparable. The only one that stands out here is Spitzer. So that was a bit of a one-off thing, but uh, Alma is doing as well as HST. So that's to say that it is a very productive uh, telescope. And so well, large programs like Atomium, your papers will, will be in here. So, <laughs> Okay, so that's what Alma is today. But Alma will uh, need to keep, keep uh, continuing. Uh, so one of the, the key parts of Alma is that this was a joint uh, collaboration worldwide. There is no bigger submillimeter millimeter telescope. So there was an agreement when uh, the Americans and the, uh, and the Europeans and the Japanese, well, the East Asians, I should say, because also some other countries are involved. Um, one of the things they said from the beginning, we need to keep developing ALMA. So we need to keep it on the forefront of technology. So, so here you see ALMA uh, as it is. This is a, a real picture with, taken with a drone, of course. Uh, so, uh, some of the new things. So, how can we keep Alma going? So, this is something that directly applies to you, and actually, right away, is you can, as of next year, you will be putting in, well, you will have the possibility to put in joint proposals. So, that means if you have a science case that needs both the VLT and Alma, you can submit it in one proposal. And you submit it to the proposal that asks the, the largest amount of time. So, if you ask for like uh, five nights of VLT, and uh, 10 hours of ALMA, you submit it to the VLT. And if it's the opposite, if you want to have uh, 40 hours of ALMA time and, uh, and a bit a few spectra with X shooter or so, you submit it to ALMA. So this is possible as of next year. So in the next ESO period, this should be offered. So in uh, the one that call for proposals in March, uh, this is intended to be offered. Uh, I think it should be ready. Uh, there's, of course, a bit of growing pains for JWST. I, should check, it should be ready, uh, but I'm not 100% sure if it is in the current uh, cycle two call for proposals. I should check myself, but um, this uh, in principle is possible. This is really uh, a big thing because if both of these telescopes are difficult to get time, and if your science case gets stronger by getting by adding the little bit of uh, time from the other telescope, well, not little bit, but by adding the other telescope time, you have a stronger case and you increase your chances to, to get your proposal as a coherent multi-wavelength proposal in. So really this is a new thing and uh, this has been pushed a lot and now it's coming. So this is really uh, very, very important uh, from a science proposal. So this is, this is there. It's, uh, it's not the future, well, it's the, the imminent future, let's say. The other thing is that ALMA will also have guaranteed tight observations, and that's mostly for instrument builders or people who really contribute a lot. So it's a bit like the VLT concept will also now come to, uh, to ALMA. So that's, uh, it will be limited because the subscription is so high, we don't want to scare too many regular users away. Uh, another new thing is, uh, and this is a little bit longer, but this is where we need the input from the community, are the advanced data products. Um, and this is like, uh, a bit like in the phase three for the VLT, you get, uh, you provide advanced data products and like really reduced data products, like could be time series, it could be uh, very detailed spectra with catalogs that, uh, or, or catalogs of, of images uh, that go over a large field. So these, we're still, think, oh, can be polarization products, uh, lots of these things. So this is new and ESO is developing this and we're actually having currently uh, a call for development studies that is deliberately asking for this. So for example, for Atomium, if you have certain advanced data reduction techniques that you think could be applied to larger data sets, this could be one of the options that you could think of, uh, of providing that. And you even can get funding from ESO uh, with some, some help. I mean, I'm the one <laughs> coordinating this funding and there's a deadline of the 24th of January for this. So if you're interested in this, just come and see me. And then the other two things that are coming are ALMA band one and two. Band one is already halfway through the installation, so that's 
maybe not the next call for poles, but the one thereafter, you should be able to cover the frequency range from 35 to 50 gigahertz. So that's important for very dense gas uh, tracers in the star forming regions, you can actually uh, get this. And then another band that uh, will extend the band three, and this is uh, an extension of the band three actually into band two. So it's actually band two will cover both the band two range and the band three into a single receiver. So that is currently uh, being, being built and being tested. So that will take a few more years, but uh, then the full ALMA frequency coverage will be available. Then a bit more, uh, and looking a bit more into the future. So ALMA has done what it was initially set up to do, which was uh, three science cases, three prime science drivers, let's say, was detecting galaxies up to redshift three, normal galaxies, has been mostly done. Detecting protoplanetary proto disks, that has also been done. I showed a few of those images. And making reliable images of, uh, of range of objects. I mean, again, that has been mostly done. So we, the ALMA partners sat together and uh, set up the next generation of science drivers for ALMA, and it was basically origins of galaxies, so high redshift universe, origin of chemical complexity, it's like really how the molecules are being formed, uh, especially the prebiotic molecules and, and others in, uh, in star forming regions, and then the origins of planets, which again, ALMA is already working quite hard on, but uh, at some point we, we start hitting the technical limitations of the current ALMA receivers. So to do this, there is um, the main implementation, the first implementation of this is this, uh, a new project called the Wideband Sensitivity Upgrade. And the main thing here is to increase the bandwidth, the instantaneous bandwidth of the receivers to up to four times the current bandwidth. So if you're doing continuum observations, you will have four times the current bandwidth. So that will, of course, increase the sensitivity a lot. It also improves your UV coverage. So that's a bit of a technical term, but uh, if your bandwidth is larger, you fill your UV plane better and you have more reliable im images faster. Um, so for this, we want to increase the bandwidth, but not compromise on any of the other systems. So you want to have the sensitivity of the receivers remain the same. So that's what we call the receiver temperature. But you need also new digitizers, which is because the Receivers, when they uh, record the signal, it's an analog, of course, but then it needs to be digitized. And the current digitization works with two bits, which is not much. So if you're trying to get a signal with two bits, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, you only have four options. Uh, but if you do this with five or six bits, you have many more options. So your digitization is a lot more efficient if you do this. And this was not available at the time ALMA was being built, but now it is available, even over these broad bandwidths. And this, you can gain the efficiency of digitizing your signal from 86 to 99%. That's equivalent to adding five new antennas into the array. The sensitivity is like five additional antennas for about four million, while a new antenna is probably like 10, 15 million. So it's a one-off improvement that we can do, and now is the time to do it. So we're doing all of this. We also need a new correlator. Sounds like a simple thing, but it isn't. <laughs> it's the correlator is the big computer that combines all the signals to be able to get this broader bandwidth, you need a new supercomputer and while still using the old one. So we are actually going to build that one down at 2,900 meters elevation at new fibers so that you can easily switch from one to the other. If the new one doesn't work, we keep working a little bit, a few months lo longer with the old one. So this is uh, a lot of effort, uh, but that again, it needs to be done once, otherwise you cannot use this broader bandwidth. So it's basically replacing ALMA, almost all of ALMA and also the receivers need to be upgraded, of course, uh, because they are not built to do this thing. So that this will take a lot of time. So then this will take a decade to get everything uh, installed and ready. So it's basically the whole ALMA system that changes. So what does this show? So the gray bars is what we currently have. That's the instantaneous bandwidth. Again, sorry, in gigahertz, <laughs> but it doesn't matter what unit it is. Uh, almost. So the minimum goal is, is this blue line, but the real goal is this orange line. So you can see really getting all the receivers much better. And this band two, uh, the new one that is being built, it's the last one of the original receivers, but we already knew that we were going for larger bandwidth. So this is already probably it's going to reach the goal itself. So this is being tested right now. So, but this receiver will already be ready for the wideband sensitivity upgrade. In the end, it will be the first one to be ready. Um, 
The other thing, and that could be important, especially for, for stellar science, is for all of these, you will actually get very high spectral resolution over the whole band. So you would get four times the bandwidth with the full uh, spectral resolution over the whole bandwidth. So you don't no longer have to compromise on bandwidth or spectral resolution. You get the best spectral resolution throughout. So this is really quite powerful. So you see, um, in, in some of the bands, you have to make a little bit of a compromise, but not much only in the lowest frequency band. So you really get, uh, you can improve the velocity resolution even more than this 0.1 kilometer per second. You get it all at once. So this is illustrated here. For, for example, the current ALMA has this PILS survey is actually looking at, uh, that gets one of these. So this is a long spectrum, but it's been done. We composed with all of these little uh, bandwidths here. And the future will get this orange. So you see how much faster this will go in the future. So that's really an, an amazing improvement. So you'll be able to do, in the same time, a lot deeper and more spectral lines. But also, for high redshift universe, if you have a redshift range where you want to search for lines, you uh, currently have to do four or sometimes five spectral settings to find where the line could be. But in the future, just two, and you, you have it. So it will be a lot, a lot uh, faster to do ALMA also as a redshift search machine. So really, the spectral domain of ALMA will improve substantially. So this is just a bit of a, a summary of what was there. So we're doing really uh, upgrades of resolution, spectral bandwidth, and also just the whole observing speed will go better. And uh, so many uh, spectral uh, science domains will, uh, will benefit from this. Uh, so planet formation, uh, star formation, galaxy formation, you really this increased bandwidth will help a lot to reach your science much faster and be able to do more science or, or go much to much fainter, fainter objects. Uh, see, uh, so who is doing this? So Europe is providing uh, quite a bit. This band two is already happening. These digitizers that I said, where you want to go from to six bit digitizers. We're also doing the new fiber. Uh, optics, we're upgrading two of the bands, and then our colleagues in North America will actually provide the new correlator. Uh, the Japanese will expand this even further, do a, a few more bands. The North America is also doing band six. Uh, so this uh, really, we're distributing this effort throughout uh, the worldwide partners of, of ALMA. So and there will be, of course, a lot of challenges. This won't be easy to, to do in a working telescope, So, but we're we're having a big plan uh, of how we want want to do this. Then going even further, and I'm almost done here, this is actually almost looking beyond ALMA. So first thing, the current ALMA is limited to 16 kilometer baselines. We're also looking at expanding this, like to going to 30, 40, 50 kilometer baselines to get even higher spatial resolution. This is again, not so easy because you have to have these fibers laid out further out. You have to find proper locations, you have to build roads. So this uh, is not something we're going to be able to do easily, uh, short, uh, but maybe by the end of the 2030s, we'll uh, start looking into getting this expanded race also. One thing that is, uh, I add with a question mark, is if it would ever happen, I don't know yet, uh, is multi-beam receivers. So that is doing at looking at different locations in the sky, like mapping several locations in each of the telescopes. So you spatial domain will uh, will become larger. But this remains complex because you have to replace all of the receivers. So this is, uh, we don't know yet if that will, will actually happen. And then beyond ALMA, and this is actually a picture where I have a, a bit of a personal, uh, this I was actually involved in this. It's uh, ALMA is limited field of view and uh, telescopes like APEX look at wider things, but they're, they're a little bit limited in size. It's a 12 meter telescope. So uh, we are looking also, uh, and uh, with a collaboration of, of different scientists within Europe and also in Japan, into a new large single dish, uh, like we're thinking of a 50 meter telescope with two degree field of view that you can then use to map uh, really wide areas with high sensitivity and also fill in these missing spacings that you get uh, with ALMA as an interferometer, you go very deep. So this is the very beginning of, uh, of the ideas of such a telescope. And one of the things that I'm personally involved in or even leading <laughs> is the site selection. So I have uh, actually gone around uh, up there and here you see the APEX telescope and we've started putting up, uh, this was actually taken, a picture taken last week. Uh, we've just put up these weather towers up to 24 meters 
uh, to get better information on the wind speed. So if you put a 50 meter telescope without a dome up there, uh, you really want to know how high is the wind speed, uh, how fast does it vary. It's called the wind power spectrum. So that's why you have put up these weather towers. So if you, <laughs> I know something <laughs> about weather towers now too and, and how to put up big towers like this with solar energy, by the way. So it's all clean. It will be a clean telescope, <laughs> a green and clean telescope. Okay. Um, so that was the part about ALMA, so I'm mostly done, but I added a little bit uh, extra slides of coming to ESO. Uh, so this is taken from the presentation we had yesterday. Uh, this is especially aimed at the students among you, uh, but not only, so uh, don't, uh, don't go away if you're not a student. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, there are several options to your PhD at ESO, or part of your PhD, I should say. Uh, part or all of it. Uh, so there's, um, I, I would say your first contact point for this is Rick Klaas, who used to be here, and, uh, and he was there yesterday, so in Brussels for the 60 day anniversary. So he knows everything about this. So he will probably pass by one of these days, uh, ask him, email him, uh, he knows he's done it. <laughs> and he can tell you how nice it is to, to work in an environment in, uh, in Munich, uh, at least in the Munich side. And I think Hugues has lots of students, Emma Bordier, I was with her at Apex uh, la last month, uh, well, a few weeks ago. Uh, so she will tell you how nice it is to, to do it in, in Chile. So there's a lot of options. It's really an, uh, an amazing environment. Uh, so I would just like to give a few slides uh, where you can see the possibilities. So, uh, so both Garking and Vitakura are really, uh, at Santiago, are amazing areas with lots of people coming through. You get to get a feel of the, how an observatory works. Uh, in Garching, which I know, of course, a bit better, uh, you have uh, big institutes, big universities next door, so it's a big campus where you can combine things. Um, one of the biggest in Europe, in, in principle, and you see really how all of these telescope development, how the ELT will come online. Uh, I mean, you would be around if you go to Garching or Chile, you would, you really get to see the people who are bringing this new telescope online, it's an, it's an amazing time to, to be at ESO, of course. Um, and so, yeah, so I think there is a lot of uh, things. There are even some videos uh, here that explain how the, the science life is at ESO. So how can you do it? Well, there's several ones. This IMPRESS program is one of them, and that uh, gives you three and a half years. You apply once per year. The deadline has just passed for, for this time, so this is more for the master's students among you, or those who you know, so you can just... Um, and so the good thing is you do one application and you apply to four institutes at once. So you, can, you don't apply only to ESO, you apply to all of those institutes at once. Um, so there's uh, about 20 students starting every year, of which four of them go to ESO. Now there are pre-selected projects uh, that will then be put uh, online every, for before every call. And so you just can select one of those, uh, those projects and then apply for it for the full time. The other one is the ESO studentship. So that's the, which is a bit easier, I would say, to, to get. Uh, so I'll show this one. Um, so that's both in, uh, in, in Germany and in, in, in Chile. Um, so this has two deadlines, uh, one in the end of May and one in the end of November that just passed. And here we look at nationalities and we have not had enough Belgians. So that's, again, you have <laughs> a plus point here. Um, uh, so that this also, here you need to set up a collaboration with an ESO staff member first. You need to make sure that your PhD has been guaranteed. Uh, so for the, this is for maximum two years. So it can also be for as short as six months. Uh, so, it, and of course from here, it's very close. I mean, it's, uh, you can easily come back uh, for periods and you can have your supervisor come to ESO also during the time you're there. Um, so, but this is, uh, I would think, is the easiest way in, uh, the ESO studentship, and it's deliberately made to have better interactions with the uh, member state institutes. And again, uh, we have not had enough Belgians in this program yet. Especially in Garking, I would say. In, in Chile, it's doing a bit better. Uh, and then for those of you who have already started your PhD, so now going a little bit, uh, little bit older, this the fellowship. And here I can talk personally. I started at ESO as an ESO fellow. And this is what gave me a staff position at ESO. <laughs> Just, I mean, I 
there's no way around it. This uh, experience you get uh, gives you a bit, really a head start. You know the inner parts of ESO. It really helps a lot, and also studentships help a lot. If you don't have to spend uh, all of your career at ESO necessarily, but having a bit of the experience gives you a little bit of a plus uh, to apply to understand what ESO needs. So the, the fellowship is really uh, an amazing experience, and uh, both in Gaching and in Chile, it's, it's a bit, the uh, emphasis is a bit more on observatory work in Chile, a bit more on instrumentation work in, in Gaching, although you can also be based in Gaching and uh, spend some of your, your, your time in Chile to help with the observatory observations. Um, the additional little thing for Chile is your fourth year, you can choose wherever you want. So you can actually spend your fourth year uh, in Leuven or, or any, anywhere else in the ESO Member State Institute. So this is an additional bonus that you have when you, you go to, uh, to Chile. This is more for the, uh, the staff members now, uh, or actually also uh, now also for uh, advanced students or young, young postdocs. Uh, the visitor program uh, is, has always been around, both again, both in Chile and in, in Gaching. So here you can visit, normally it's for one or two months, but you can, uh, some visitors have stayed for almost up to a year, although that's a bit more complex, uh, also to be away for a, for a year, I think university wouldn't be happy to see you <laughs> go for that long, but uh, still. Um, so this works very well, for example, if you have a student at ESO and you want to spend a month with your student and the, su the local supervisor, just uh, apply for this program, the chances to go through are actually quite, quite good. And we've now also opened that uh, specifically for uh, students within three years from the PhD. So young postdocs can also come to ESO and spend time to, uh, to visit there. So this is new in the ESO visitor program. Then again, the younger, the, the very younger, even before uh, almost, well, the young master students can also come for internships. So this is, uh, there's two internal calls. So there's no fixed deadline. It uh, depends a bit on the, available funding and, and how many they were selected. So this is to really spend uh, one to three months to ESO, so it's, it's a bit of a sampler. You can even do this one first and then later apply for a studentship. Uh, so this is really a, a, a unique you know, opportunity to get to know ESO a little bit for young people, masters, or even slightly below bachelor, last year bachelors could also try to do an uh, internship at ESO uh, in this. And again, this is something, a project that is run the ESO studentship, uh, the summer research program, this is always in July. This is heavily oversubscribed, but again, uh, we have had Belgians in this program, so that's, that's, uh, it has been known out here too. Um, and this is actually organized by the fellows in Chile. So they, the fellows completely organize this. They have courses and they have research projects for uh, a student to spend six weeks at ESO. It's all done simultaneously at the same time so that you actually get to build up a bit of, um, of a, a group feeling in this. So it's all in July, and uh, I think the deadline is in February. For, so this is also still an option um, for future people. And I think that was it. Thank you. You were encouraging the uh, the people to go to uh, the uh, uh, band one and band two. What are the advantage compared to the uh, other new science you can do in those bands? Well, there are. Uh, it's it's a new frequency domain, so it's lines that have not been observed. Uh, I'm not sure if the online people can see me. Also, move back here. Um, so there are new frequency uh, new uh, molecules that you could not observe with the current bands. Especially, I mean, unless you go with redshifts, of course, but uh, taking, taking the local universe, there are really lots of new molecules that are being in there. And also the ratios between the molecules gives you uh, temperature and density and uh, magnetic field uh, indications and so. So this, it actually opens up new science. Um, also in the continuum, you're moving to a range where other processes like synchrotron are becoming much more dominant. So you can easily disentangle synchrotron from uh, thermal dust emission by having those, those bands covered. So it's, it's new science, I would say. It's not uh, better necessarily, it's, it's new science.
The very long baselines are often uh, are offered only every two years. Is that correct? Is that still will that still remain like such? Because for the high spatial resolution, you need. Those. Yes, uh, the I mean it's a bit complex to. Um, put it in Dennis in the long baselines and also if the weather is not very good uh, for the long baselines and yeah then you cannot observe so they don't want to keep Alma in the long baselines for too long so they do leave it in there as long as it is as we have projects to observe because it's yeah otherwise the, there's the pressure on the other configurations is also so high that uh, that it's difficult to do so so long baselines will remain uh, to be offered, obviously, uh, but I don't think they will do it more often. I think there is more of a push uh, to finally you make it more efficient to for high frequency observations. So high frequency observations can be done in any configuration almost, and there will be specific. Uh, in the last call, there was already a specific emphasis on high frequency. So really, that I would say it needs good weather, but. Yeah, you need enough projects in the in the queue covering a range of uh, of, of uh, positions in the sky in the RA. So high frequency will be done probably a little bit more, a bit more push for that, but not at the expense of uh, of high um, of long configuration, large configurations. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, especially the students come and see me if you have questions. 